Hey, this is Joshua Page from the church at Mon River. Thanks for taking time to listen to this teaching today. I hope that as we look at the Bible together, that it helps you to grow in your love for God, gives you some practical ways to show love for one another, and it inspires you to go out and make more followers of Jesus. Enjoy the teaching. Now, a man was sick, Lazarus from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. And it was her brother Lazarus who was sick. So the sisters sent a message to him, Lord, the one you love is sick. When Jesus heard it, he said, this sickness will not end in death, but is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after that, he said to the disciples, let's go to, to, to Judea again. Rabbi, the disciples told him, just now the Jews tried to stone you, and you're going there again? Aren't there 12 hours in a day? Jesus answered. If anyone walks during the day, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of his world. But if anyone walks during the night, he does stumble because the light is not in him. He said this and then he told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am on my way to wake him up. Then the disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will get well. Jesus, however, was speaking about his death, but they thought he was speaking about natural sleep. So Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. I'm glad for you that I wasn't there so that you may believe, but let's go to him. Then Thomas, called a twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go too so that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, less than two miles away. Many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them about their brother. As soon as Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Yet even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Your brother will rise again, Jesus told her. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, Yo soy la resurrección y la vida. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who comes into the world. Having said this, she went back and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling for you. As soon as Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, her saw, consoling her, saw that Mary got up quickly and went out. They followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to cry there. As soon as Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and told him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have had died. When Jesus saw her crying and the Jews who had come with her, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Where have you put him? He asked. Lord, they told him, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, couldn't he who opened the blind man's eyes also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Remove the stone, Jesus said. 
Martha and the dead man's sister told him, Lord, there is already a, a stench because he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you. I thank you that you hurt me. I know that you always hear me, but because of the crowd standing here, I said this, so that they may believe you sent me. After he said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out of bound, came out bound, hand and foot with linen strips, and with his lace wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Unwrap him and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he did believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. And this is the word of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Well, at the beginning of this story, we see this family, and uh, one of the members of the family, Lazarus, he is really sick. And Lazarus' sisters are very concerned about him in this illness. And then as the story continues, we see that Lazarus' illness eventually leads to his death. And we see as the story goes on that Mary, Martha, and the family members are grieving the passing of their brother. And these are scenarios that all of us in this room can certainly connect with. Maybe for some of you, you come into this place today carrying some health struggles with you. You know, for some of the families in this room, we've had little ones who have been very sick. Just last week, Matt and Sarah had to take their little one on Sunday morning to urgent care because they were concerned about him. And these health concerns, they, they trouble us because we care for you that are hurting and you care for yourself. This can also connect with many of us in this room because we've lost loved ones in our lives. Maybe it's a parent or a grandparent or a friend. Someone that you care about is no longer with us, and the pain of that death is not quickly forgotten. And whether this describes you here in your current circumstances, for all of us, we all carry struggles and burdens. There's things that keep us awake at night, the stresses in our life that give us upset stomachs or increase our blood pressure. Maybe for you, it's a concern over school, these constant demands of deadlines, of assignments. Maybe your concern is how you're going to pay for your school in the upcoming semester. For others of us, it's the concerns of a job, not being able to meet up to the unrealistic expectations that your company has placed on you. Or maybe you carry the stress of uncertainty of your job. For others of us, you may come concerned about how you're going to cover some car repairs or some repairs in your home. Maybe you're troubled by a relationship, someone that you care about very deeply and you're currently living in conflict with. For all of us in these different scenarios, these issues in our life are things that cause us concern, cause us stress. Some of us, they may even cause us grief. And today, as we look at John chapter 11, we'll see that the climax of this story is this great miracle that happens at the very end of John chapter 11. But I want us to think more as we go through this about Jesus' reaction to the crowds and Martha and Mary, and, and then we'll eventually get to that miracle at the end. The main takeaway that I have for you today, we'll see, is that Jesus is not worried, but he does care. Jesus is not worried, but he does care. And I wish I could say that as you leave this place today, that as a result of my teaching, that all of your troubles will be fixed. But unfortunately, that's not the case. When you go back home, you're going to return to the same concerns that you came into this place with. 
But it is my hope that as we look at the words of Jesus Christ from John chapter 11, that you will leave this place today with assurance. That you'll leave this place with comfort. As you know that there is a God who sees and cares, but at the same time, he is not worried. Let's jump into this text in John chapter 11. It's this long narrative, and uh, John, he introduces this family to us, Lazarus and Martha and Mary. He says they lived in this town of Bethany. I learned this week that it was a town right outside of the capital city of Jerusalem. And it's clear by the details in this story that Jesus was close to this family. In verse 5, it says that he loved this family. When their servant comes and addresses Jesus, he calls him Lord. This indicates to us that these three are disciples of Jesus. We'll see later on in chapter 12 that Jesus, when he comes back into town, he will stay with this family. And Lazarus is very sick. Don't tell us why, but sudden illness that comes on him. Mary and Martha, they send a servant to go find Jesus and ask him to come back quickly. His response is not, oh my, I must go at once. In fact, Jesus was not worried at all. He tells the servant this, he says, This sickness will not end in death, but it is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Certainly, this was not the response that the servant was anticipating. He ran all the way from Bethany to find Jesus, and yet he returns all alone. To further show that he's not worried, Jesus goes on to wait two days before doing anything at all. He just carries on with ministry as normal. Verse 14, it says, uh, after those two days had passed, that Jesus supernaturally knew that Lazarus had died. And Jesus says this. He says, I'm glad for you that I wasn't there so that you may believe. Seems like an odd statement. And then Jesus says, now Lazarus is dead. Let us now go back to Bethany. And while Jesus is not worried, his disciples certainly were. Not so much about Lazarus, but for their own safety. Say, hey, Jesus, do not forget that the Jews in that town were just trying to kill you when you told them about how your words and your works pointed to you being the Messiah. And now you want to go back there? Are you crazy? And Jesus and his inner circle of disciples, they traveled the two-day journey to Bethany to see this family. And there in verse 19, it says, Many Jews had come to grieve with Mary and Martha. I read this week that in their culture that when someone passed it, they would grieve for a month. And the family would hire a flute player to play constantly, and they would hire professional wailers to mourn with them. While all this grieving is going on, Martha, she goes out to meet Jesus. Certainly her, her eyes are puffy and red. And in her grief, she expresses her faith in Jesus. She says, Jesus, if you had just been here sooner, you could have healed Lazarus. But again, Jesus was not worried at all. He says, your brother will rise again. And why was Jesus not worried? His friend is really sick. And he has the power to heal him. Why did this not cause him to rush off to Bethany as soon as possible? Beyond that, he could have just spoken a word and Lazarus would have been healed as we saw with Jesus healing the official's son. Why does he wait until after Lazarus was dead to respond at all? 
And even more, with Martha, she comes grieving the loss of her brother. Why was Jesus not worried in the least? You know, his friend had just died. It's because Jesus knew how the story would end. Jesus knew how the story would end. He'd been alluding to this all along. In verse 4, he says, this sickness will not end in death. He wasn't saying that Lazarus wouldn't die. He was saying it would not end in death. In verse 11, he tells his disciples, he says, Lazarus is asleep. Let's go wake him up. And Martha, she comes to Jesus in her grief. And his only thought is, your brother will rise again. Jesus wasn't worried about Lazarus getting sick and dying because he knew how the story would end. He knew that grief and death would not hold the last word. And Martha, she responds to Jesus. She says, yeah, I know that he will rise on the last day when the dead are raised to life. And then Jesus gives us his fifth I am statement that we see in the book of John. Jesus says this, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And then starting in verse 38, we see the end of the story. What Jesus knew was coming all along. He goes to the tomb where Lazarus had been dead for four days. He tells the servants to pull the large stone away from the entrance to the cave. Martha comments. She says, hey, I think this is a bad idea. His body is certainly going to smell by now. She knew that Lazarus would have already started to decay. Then Jesus prays, and he shouts out, Lazarus, come out! And the dead man walks out of the grave. And Leading up to this miracle, Jesus was not worried at all. And it wasn't because he was a heartless jerk, but he knew the miracle that laid ahead that Lazarus was just taking a little nap. He knew that he had power over all creation. He had demonstrated it through walking on the waves and calming the storm and feeding the thousands and here bringing the dead back to life. And his delay, yes, it allowed Lazarus to die. And this produced grief for this family But he knew of the joy and the amazement that was in store for these grieving sisters and the family and friends who came to mourn with them and the onlooking disciples. And he knew that in the end, this would all lead to their belief and that God would be praised. And listen, for us in this room, The same God who knew what laid ahead for Lazarus and his sisters is still active in our world today. And though there are trials that we face, he is not in heaven wringing his hands in concern. Our God is not worried about your struggles. And it's not because he's an estranged father. It's because he knows the end. This doesn't mean that everything in our lives will work out in this moment exactly like we're hoping. The story didn't unfold like Martha and Mary and friends had hoped. They all wanted Jesus to come immediately to heal Lazarus, but he didn't. And in tears, they all expressed the same disappointment to Jesus. Martha and Mary, they both say, Jesus, if you had just been here sooner, our brother wouldn't have died. 
Jewish crowds. They say, hey, he healed the blind. Could he not have kept this man from dying? But listen, Jesus was not late. He was late for what they were hoping for, for their plans. But he was right on time for what he planned to do. Heal Lazarus from the sickness? Nah, watch this. And in response, he calls the crowd to believe in him. And listen, in the troubles in your life, God might not show up like you hope, but he gives us a promise that it is all working exactly as he intends. You see this promise in Romans chapter 8. He says, all things work together for the good, for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those who are his sheep, of God and are in line with his plans, our suffering, our tears, even our death have a purpose. We talked about this just a couple weeks ago as we looked at one of the other stories. That purpose may just be what God is doing in your life to grow your faith and your Christ likeness or to turn other people's attention to worship of Jesus. And listen, even if that healing or, or job that you hope for a relationship, it doesn't come, it is still all good because we know how the story ends. It's been recorded for us in this book that those who are in Christ, they are part of the eternal kingdom where there will be no tears and there will be no death and there will be no struggle with sin. And listen, these momentary light Afflictions, they are producing for us an eternal weight of glory. And the result of this, for those of us who are Christians, who are followers of Jesus, what is the worst that could happen to us? Even if we die, we can confidently say, Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? We have assurance that Jesus died on the cross and he paid the penalty for my sin. We have the comfort that he is the resurrection and the life. And not only did he raise Lazarus from the dead, on the third day he raised himself from the dead. He gives us the promise that if we follow him, that we will be raised too. And we can face the trials in our life with fearlessness and with hope. We cannot be overcome with worry because we know how the story ends. Our king has conquered the grave. He is the resurrection and the life. Just this week, I read the story of Ignatius from Fox's Book of Martyrs. He was a church leader in uh, 110 AD. Under the Roman Emperor Trajan, he was arrested for preaching about Jesus. And Ignatius was center, sentenced to be fed to the lions alive. And he wrote to the church in Rome prior to his execution. Listen to these words. He says, Now I begin to be a disciple. I care nothing of visible or invisible things, so that I may but win Christ. Let fire and the cross, let the companions of wild beasts, let the breaking of bones and the tearing of limbs, of the grinding of the whole body and all the malice of the devil come upon me. 
be it so, only may I win Christ Jesus. Oh, this is a man who understood the words of Jesus upon hearing that his friend Lazarus was sick when he said, the sickness will not end in death, but it is only for the glory of God. This is a man when facing the claws and the teeth of the lion who had confidence that the one who believes in Jesus, even if he dies, he will live. And this may give us courage in the face of death. What about all the other concerns in our lives? Well, guess what? God has those too. We see these words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6. He says, Therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? And can any of you add a moment to his lifespan by worrying? And why do you worry about clothes? Observe the wildflowers in the field that grow. They don't labor or spin thread, yet I tell you that even Solomon in all of his splendor was adorned like one of these. Now that's how God clothes the grass of the field which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow. Won't he do much more for you, O you of little faith? Don't worry, saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek after all these things, And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be provided for you. Jesus establishes this teaching on the truth that God is a good father. And that he will care for his children. A little example of this for me and our family on Journeying on this church startup, I've had to fundraise my salary. I've shared about some of these experiences with you before. And um, unfortunately, just a couple weeks ago, I had one of our major church partners that's been with us from the beginning send me a message and saying in 2023, they're going to reduce some of their giving to us as a church. And while I know that God has provided for us time and time again, I have to confess that this did bring some anxiety within me. I praise God for my great wife who reminded me, hey, God's always taking care of us. He will take care of us again. And while I know these truths in my mind, I have to confess that in the moment, my heart was struggling to catch up. But listen, I just want to share with you, just this week, I had another one of our partner churches that's been with us from the beginning. One of the pastors there, he reached out to me and said, hey, Joshua, I'd like to talk to you about our support of your ministry. I called him this week, and he said, hey, we know that you've been doing ministry there for several years now, and we figure that you probably have more expenses now than what you did before. And so we want to increase our giving for 2023 to you and to this ministry. And the amount that they're going to give to us is almost equal to the amount that this other church is reducing. This is our good God's provision. And listen, if you're not facing trials in your life now, one thing is certain, you will. And what comfort these truths are to us, that in the midst of physical needs, Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 6 says, hey, I take care of the birds and the flowers. I got this. And Jesus' words in John chapter 11, on the doorstep of death, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. I got this.
But there is this space between God's promise and God's provision. In the story that I told you, it's several weeks between one church's negative news and the other church's increased provision. With Ignatius, it's the space between being bound in chains and staring at a hungry lion and actually meeting his Savior upon his death. The story in John chapter 11, it's the space between Jesus saying, this will not end in death, and Lazarus being raised from the dead. And we all know that this space is hard. We are faced with real challenges, with real pains. In the case of Ignatius, it was the real pain of claws tearing against his skin, his bones being crushed under the bite of the lion. With Martha and Mary, it's the real pain of sitting at the bedside of Lazarus for hours, seeing their brother gasping for every breath as his body gave up on him. My story, in a much lesser way, it's me looking at the budget and saying, how are we going to make all this work? And listen, you may have tremendous hope in Jesus. You may have the faith of Ignatius, but that space between God's promise and God's provision is hard. And my main point today is that even though Jesus is not worried, he does care. He does care. In the story, Martha, she goes and she gets Mary. Mary's back home mourning. And Mary goes to find Jesus. And this crowd of mourners, they follow her. She says the same thing as Martha. If you had just been here, Jesus, Lazarus wouldn't have died. And she's crying. And the Jews with her are crying. And the Messiah, who knows how the story will end, he looks on Mary in her grief. And he cries with her. Jesus wept. The crowds, they're moved by this, seeing the Messiah's tender affection in that space between God's promise and God's provision. And listen, that same God who says, don't be worried about anything, he says this, cast all your worries on him because he cares about you. Listen, friends, as a Messiah sitting at the right hand of God who has witnessed the death of a loved one, who's faced temptation from the devil himself, who has been betrayed and abandoned by his closest of companions, who has felt physical pain like none other as he was wet, whipped as the crown of thorns was driven into his head. The nails were hammered into his hands and into his feet as he hung on the cross, gasping for every breath. And the Bible says that he sympathizes with you in your weaknesses. He cares desires for you to share those burdens with him through prayer. And listen, while he does weep with those who weep, he doesn't grieve as one who has no hope. He knows how the story ends. He wrote the ending. He is the resurrection and the life. Today, as you leave this place and return to your troubles, you do so with this assurance, with this comfort.
waits alone what is our only confidence that our souls to him belong who holds our days within his hand what comes upon Thanks for listening to this teaching. I hope that it's been helpful to you. If you'd like to take a next step, we invite you to go to atmonriver.com and click on the button that says connect with us. May God bless you with the grace and peace of Jesus Christ, our Lord.